Hello, welcome or welcome back. My name is Ari, and I forgot to record an intro for this video. Anyway, today I'm talking about this trilogy that I just threw at myself. This is the Word in the Void trilogy, which is the first three books chronologically in the Shannara universe. Now, these books were published 30 years after the original Sword of Shannara, so publication date, definitely not the first books chronologically, which is how I'm reading this project, first three books. These books, all three of them take place in the United States in the mid to late 90s, and um, they follow basically two characters, John Ross and Nest Freemark. Um, in this video, I'm going to kind of like go through and talk about each one of the individual books, how they tie together, and my opinions on them. So let's just jump into book one, which is Running with the Demon. All right, Running with the Demon, which is book one of the Word and the Void trilogy. Now, this is a basic story of good and evil. The word is good, the void is evil, and the universe strives for balance. This is a book about or introducing us to John Ross, who is a knight of the word, and he is basically tasked with keeping the balance, like fighting demons who are minions of the void to, you know, keep the balance. That's, that's extremely repetitive. Thank you. How John Ross's powers work is every time he sleeps, he dreams of the future of the wor world and he will see events that are things that are happening to him in the future and it's a post-apocalyptic wasteland basically and through these dreams he can act on them in his waking hours by figuring out the origin of the events that he's dreaming about and then using that information to change them in the past and in this particular book he is going to Sinanispe Park in Illinois in the mid-90s, 1990s, and to save a 14-year-old girl named Ness Freemark. And she is like a catalyst for a very bad post-apocalyptic event in the future if he does not save her in this book. Uh, both Nest and John are significant characters not only in this book but in the rest of this series and kind of in other series but we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. Specifically about this book and my opinion on it this is probably going to be a solid three star read for me. Um, it's it's a very slow start like the first two 250 pages are just world building and character building, mostly character building because it takes place in North America in the 1990s. So like the world is our world. Um, it's just like the magic part of the world is the world building. And then your introduction to Nest and John, their specific like motivations and the people around them and stuff like that. For me, not the most exciting thing, especially on a reread. Like, it probably would have been more interesting if I wasn't already familiar with these characters because I didn't need to know their backgrounds. I already knew them. Um, there is some problematic content early on in the book, but it makes sense within the context of the book. There is... Um, transphobia and use of the word retard which first off it fit the characters that were using these terms like these were shitty trashy redneck guys and it fit their characters to be using terms like this also those particular terms weren't as 
like they were problematic but they weren't recognized as problematic when this book was written if that makes sense i hope it does the purpose of the use of those words and phrases is to build these bad guy characters who are ignorant hateful racist people who are easily influenced by um this demon because that's that's how demons work in this universe is they influence weak-minded weak-willed people to hate and this covers the first five days in july starting on july 1st ending on july 5th um so each there's like a section for each day um the end of the book is pretty good all of the action and like plot twist and um conclusions to all of these like hints of a story you've been building up to like wrap up very well at the end of this book um one thing terry brooks does really well is this does not end on a cliffhanger there is nothing where it's like oh my god i need to get to the next book right now i don't like books where like the only reason you read them is to continue on with the story um, like i have read the next book in the series so i know what it's about but if i was not like if i was coming into this for the very first time um the book two could have completely involved completely different characters all around or um use these characters again like there's so many different places the story goes and books in the shannara series do that there are some trilogies like this one where it's going to follow the same characters throughout all three books of the trilogies and there's some, like the original Shannara series, where each book is a completely different generation of, like, a single family. So overall, this is okay. It's a decent start to the series, but I'm never going to consider this my favorite book in the Shannara universe. Next is A Knight of the Word. I don't know why, but it's so hard for me not to say like a knight of the world and put an L in there, but it's the word, W-O-R-D, not world. Um, and this one, we're again following both Nest and John, um, but it's in the future. Nest is an adult. And this time, instead of John saving Nest, Nest is saving John in this book so from my memories and it's been many many years i think i like this one a whole lot more than i liked this one but we're gonna find out and you'll see in the next clip okay book two a night of the word is down it's done i'm finished uh let's start by talking about what's what this book is about basically this is kind of like a role reversal of the first book where uh, John was sent to save Ness. Now this is five, five years after the events of Running with a Demon and Ness is an adult in college and John basically is having a crisis. He, as was explained in the first book, has dreams and these dreams are events that are in the future where the world is like a desolate wasteland and demons rule and in these dreams there are clues to events that happened in the past that john is supposed to stop in service to the word and in one of the dreams that he has he is talking to a woman or he's not really talking to her she's like standing there like just reciting things because she's gone crazy with grief and she's reciting that her son was part of a shooting like a failed kidnapping attempt and some children were killed inside of a school and so john knows that he's supposed to save these children from being killed because you know that that's the good thing to do so he gets the date uh it happens on april fool's day so that's why he knows exactly when the date was basically shows up to the school and fails to stop it and then he has this like crisis that he's not actually 
preventing anything like he let children die he's a failure and he doesn't want to be a knight of the word anymore and he he kind of like does everything he can to give it up blah 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 the word will not let him let's just go with that and because he's kind of like a fallen knight that demons are trying to um you know take his magic convert him to the void since he is a fallen knight and he is no longer protected by the word because he refuses to acknowledge that he is still a knight and he can't give it up so this basically is about john is now living in Seattle, I almost said Chicago, but Seattle, and he is working for a man known as the Wizard of Oz who uh, runs homeless charities. So John's a speechwriter for homeless charities. And um, Nest gets word from the word. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it that way, but okay. And that John is going to be corrupted by the void and John has been ignoring the dreams that the word is sending him and Ness needs to go save him basically. Um, save him or J uh, John will be killed because he can't be corrupted. He's too powerful. So that's basically what the book is about. Um, I'm not going to give you like any spoilers, that's just the setup for the book. and. Um, most of this book is like trying to figure out who the demon is because obviously it has to be somebody um, near John to corrupt him and they're aware that there's a demon but it's supposed to be like who could possibly be the demon it doesn't make sense for any of these people to be the demon and it's just questioning who the freaking demon is I felt it was super like super super obvious and I don't know if that's just because it was a reread or if it was just really super obvious. I I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that, but now I kind of want to get in to like my feelings about the book. The book opens up like reintroducing characters from the last book, where it's like Pick is a Sylvan who's 150 years old and he's been with Ness and Ness is this person and it's like I get that if it's been a while since you've read this book or the previous book or you're just going into this one as the first book because they technically can be read out of order. It gives enough background that you could just read this as a standalone. I've done it in the Shannara series before is read something as a standalone. Um, but for me reading these books back to back it was like so annoying to have to read like the first like 50 or so pages of this book of stuff that I already knew because I literally had just read that last book. So that's like a personal thing and I understand why the author is doing it even if it does annoy me. One thing I realized about these books is they all take place over holidays and I didn't remember that. I, I don't know if I didn't realize it the first time or if I just didn't remember it, but the first book, <clears throat> Running with a Demon, takes place over July 4th. This place takes place over Halloween and then the third one, uh, I don't know when it takes place over, I'm going to say either Thanksgiving or Christmas would be the ones that make the most sense, but we'll find out when we get to it. The overall plotting of this book is a whole, 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 whole lot better than the first one. Like, the first book, it was just all these, like, random little plot points that you didn't know where the hell the story was going while reading it, um, and things that seemed like they would be really big plot points, like, it's even on the cover. Like, the the demon coming out of the tree seemed like at various points of this book that it would be like a huge plot point and that was like the entire purpose of the book is this like demons escaping from the tree and that nest needs to save the community from the demon and that's that's not at all <laughs> what this book was about that was like such a minor side plot in the book um but this one has a very very concise like direct plot point like John Ross is going to kill the Wizard of Oz on Halloween and 
John does not, he's like, why would I kill this man? There's no reason for me to kill this man. This is never going to happen. I can ignore this dream. And then like the entire story is directing him towards that instance of like what goes wrong in John's life to make him kill a man that he likes and respects. So again, plotting considerably better. But the most interesting, and for me personally, oh, my back hurts, the best part about this book is these little things that I've tabbed right here. And that is Terry Brooks takes the opportunity of a fantasy book, like a well-loved fantasy series, to educate the reader where this takes place in Seattle. It's modern day. It was modern day at the time it was written. So it's a contemporary fantasy set in Seattle and he can add cultural things that most people will like ignore um, of things that are going wrong in the world because it's a post-apocalyptic type of series. Like there's hints that the world is going to end because of John Ross's dreams. So why not teach readers, especially like young teenage readers, things that are wrong with the world? And he does that tackling homelessness. And he has exposition in here that just like explain like the problem with homelessness. And I want to read some of them to you. Um, just to show you like how interesting this is. So this is the uh, Wizard of Oz, his name is Simon, is meeting with a reporter and he is talking about the charities he's run which are homeless charities for abused and battered women and their children. And and that's, that's the whole charity, he runs shelters. Um, and again, he's talking to a reporter. There are 1,200 school-aged homeless children, Andrew. That's children, not women. 24% of all our homeless are under the age of 18, and that number is growing every day. Ours is a specific focus. We provide help to homeless women and children. 80% of those women and children are homeless because of domestic violence. The problem of domestic violence is growing worldwide, but especially here in the United States. The statistics regarding children who die violently are all out of proportion with the rest of the world. An American child is five times more likely to be killed before the age of 18 than a child living in another industrialized nation. The rate of gun deaths and suicides among our children is more than twice that of other countries. We like to think of ourselves as progressive and enlightened, but you have to wonder. Homelessness is an alternative to dying, but not an especially attractive one. So it is difficult for me to dwell on accomplishments when the problem remains so acute. And then he continues in that vein where it's giving like statistics about the homeless problem in America and where it's tied to education, it's tied to domestic violence, um, it's tied to like wage gap problems and putting that in a fantasy book was just so incredibly interesting and educational in a way that I love because I love tying books to education. Um, if you saw my Century Challenge you know that because it was like I could look at book trends by decade and see how the things that we were reading or things that people were reading in it in a specific decade tied to what was happening in the world during that time. The second quote in here is from an indigenous American named Two Bears. Um, he is talking to Nest and talking about like the failure of the human race and how um, it, it's like how demons are getting in and basically demons feed and increase human suffering so the theory of the magic behind this book series is that um, demons are driving people to do the horrible things that they do um, not always but a lot of times and if a human is bad enough that they will become a demon uh, anyway what two bears is saying is it is the same everywhere we are a people under siege walled away from each other and the world trying to find a safe path through the debris of hate and rage that collects around us. We drive our cars as if they were weapons. We use our children and our friends as if their love and trust were expendable and meaningless. We think of ourselves first and others second. We lie and cheat and steal in little ways, thinking it unimportant, justifying it by telling ourselves that others do it too. So it doesn't matter if we do it too. 
We have no patience with the mistakes of others. We have no empathy for their despair. We have no compassion for their misery. Those who roam the streets are not our concern. They are examples of failure and embarrassment to us. It is best to ignore them. If they are homeless, it is their own fault. They give us nothing but trouble. If they die, at least they will provide us with more space to breathe. And that to me is particularly relevant with what's going on in the world right now. Today is January 6th. Today, people stormed the Senate trying to keep Trump in power. Like, Twitter shut down Trump's, like, Twitter account for inciting violence. Like, America is a huge dumpster fire today. There are riots in the streets and there are signs that police aren't doing anything about it because the riots are about white people and not black people. Like, these things are relevant. <laughs> and it's kind of scary relevant when this was written in the 1990s and we're seeing parallels to, like, today. And this book's supposed to be about the end of the fucking world. <laughs> Like, that's scary. <laughs> Even if it is a fantasy, it's still really, really scary. Anyway, so I did think this was much, much better than Running with the Demon. There was a lot of improvement and I, I liked it. I'm still giving this a three star. I don't think it's a five star. It still has a lot of flaws and problems. Um, John Ross and Ness just really aren't my favorite characters within the overarching Shannara series. Um, I have favorite characters who come later, better storylines that I enjoy more, that are more magical, that we'll get into later. Um, I even think like the next book is going to be much better, which is a perfect segue into talking about Angel Fire East. So again, this book features Nest and John. I don't know how far into the future this is from the last interaction in Seattle, but I do know that John has discovered a very, very rare, or discovered rumor of a very, very rare fairy creature called a gypsy morph. And John and Nest have to get together and basically take the gypsy morph's magic in use for the word before the void can get a hold of the gypsy morph's magic because the gypsy morph is a neutral um fairy creature it it is neither good nor bad but can be used in a very very powerful way for either so it's kind of like a race against time to wind for the word instead of for the void, if that makes sense at all. I will be back in a few seconds for you, but probably a couple of days for me, and let you know what I thought about my reread of Angel Fire East. I am done with Angel Fire East, uh, the third book in the Word and the Void trilogy. This one keeps some trends that we've come to experience from the World in the Void trilogy. Uh, the It happens over a major holiday, in this case it's Christmas, and this one goes back to Sinatus Beat Park. It's 15 years after the first book and 10 years after the second book, and it contains a lot of the same cast from book one. So, but obviously 15 years older. Um, obviously the two main characters are still Nest and John Ross, but this time neither one of them is saving each other. John Ross has found a magic called the Gypsy Morph, and this is a wild magic that does not belong to either the Word or the Void, but can be convinced or utilized to be either good or bad. Um, it can also become anything. So an example that they use in the book is that it become it can become a deadly virus and kill thousands of people on behalf of the void or become a 
um, uh, penicillin and cure thousands of people on behalf of the word. In the case of this book, the Gypsy Morse becomes a little boy, but the little boy doesn't talk. Um, he doesn't really do anything except for stare into space. And while John Ross is fleeing the demons who are tracking them um, across the country, the only word that the Gypsy Morph utters is nest. And John is like, maybe Nest will know what to do. So he shows up at her house a few days before Christmas. Um, and it kind of goes from there. This one, unlike the other books where it's only like one demon attacking them, this one has like a gang of demons because this magic is just that important. So getting into spoiler territory on this book, this is an immaculate conception story. Um, this book literally ends with her pregnancy. There is nothing in here about like what the gypsy morph becomes as her child. It is implied that will be covered in the next trilogy, which I will read next month. And <laughs> the answer to that question is kind of, it's complicated. <laughs> so as I said, these are rereads. I've read all of these books, so I know what happens in the next trilogy. And it's not like what you think is <laughs> as far as like just a being about nest child. Um, it's it's way out there, but we'll get to that next month. Um, this first trilogy is not as good as I remember it being from my first read, but it is very important to the overall understanding of the world building of the Shannara universe. And <laughs> reading it the first time and not knowing like how the F this is a Shannara book, um, I was very confused. So if you've been watching my videos when I'm kind of talking about the book series as a whole and to not read these in chronological order, if you're not going to read them and you just kind of want to know what the hell that huge plot twist is, um, I'm going to say it. So skip over <laughs> this section if you don't want to know what that huge plot twist is. But all of the other Shannara build books are very very high fantasy with like elves, dwarfs, um, magic, druids, things like that. And reading this the first time I was like how in the absolute shit does these books that are set in, in modern day America tie into this high fantasy world at all? And the answer is, is that Shannara is not a high fantasy world, it's a post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> so what this series does is introduces us to the beginnings of the Shannara magic in a modern setting. And then the next series we're going to move into like a post-apocalyptic like series. And I love post-apocalyptic books, so I think that those will be higher than three stars that this one was because um, this was more of like magical realism than post-apocalyptic. And then onwards from that you're moving thousands of years into the future of America which kind of looks like Tolkien's fairyland. And that's the huge plot twist in Shannara that gets spoiled if you read these books in chronological order instead of publication order. So there you go. Now now you know. Anyway, the series overall, okay, not great. I don't particularly care for Nestor John Ross as characters. Um, they're just not my favorite in the universe, but they're not bad. Like there's nothing bad about any, any of these books. They lean towards like the good side of three stars. I just know that there's better to be found in the Shannara series. And this is like a prequel series where it's giving you a lot of the world building and a lot of setup without any of like the real substance that you're going to get in like the original Shannara trilogy. So done, good, 
The series that I am reading next month is the Genesis of Shannara trilogy. Um, more information will be on that trilogy in my TBR for next month. So if you want to read along with me, you can start there. <laughs> Especially if I just spoiled everything in this, like, trilogy for you. The good thing about Shannara is the trilogies are separate enough that they tie together as a universe, but you can, like, start pretty much wherever you want. There's a couple of the trilogies that are tied too closely within the previous trilogy that you can't start, um, but most of them separate enough. You could definitely start wherever, and I know for sure in these books, like, the first few chapters of each one of these books basically told you what happened in the last book is like a summary. So you can get a lot of it in, like, skip around in books. Like, my first Shannara book was the second book in the original trilogy. <laughs> and that's where I started with the Shannara world. So you could really start most anywhere. But if you want to start with me on the dystopian trilogy in the Shannara universe called The Genesis of Shannara. I will be reading that in February. Again, more info on my TBR. Thank you for hanging out with me while I read these three. Let's go this way. Yay! Um, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!